Welcome to Bullet Point Nursing. My name is Dr. Goldstein. In this series, we go through essentially everything you need to know relating to nursing pharmacology. All the notes that we use in these videos are available to be downloaded off of our website, and we recommend you do that and follow along. Today, we're going to be talking about pulmonology, and we have a ton to get into, so let's begin with the most obvious, which is oxygen. Oxygen is a pharmaceutical agent in the United States, so this is definitely fair game for any pharmacology course that you may be taking. This is a prescription medication. You cannot just order a tank off of Amazon. You can, but it's going to come empty, no oxygen in it. So this medication, like any medication, is given via specific route, but instead of PO or IV, it's given the inhaled route. More specifically, we narrow it down to nasal cannula, simple face mask, non reader and so on. All of us right now are breathing, and the air that we're breathing in is 21% oxygen and 79% roughly of nitrogen. So what that means is using rough numbers, one fifth of all of the air that we bring into our lungs is actually oxygen. The other 80% of it is something that we do not need to be breathing in. So we're breathing in all this air just for that one fifth of it that's oxygen. And that's what our body needs to inhale to give us oxygen that our cells need. That when we talk about giving a patient oxygen, uh, a term to understand here is oxygenation. When we give a patient oxygen, we're oxygenating the air that we breathe. We're increasing the amount of oxygen that is in the air that they breathe. So when they take in a breath of air, when they have a nasal cannula or they have a knock breather on, they're getting more than one fifth of that as oxygen. They're getting 40, 50, even 100% of what they're breathing in is now oxygen molecules. And that has a lot of positive benefits. A few rough numbers to understand here. First of all, when we put a patient on a nasal cannula, the rough number is that every time we give a patient an additional liter per minute via nasal cannula, we're increasing their O2 concentration that they're breathing by roughly 4%. So for example, if I give you two liters nasal cannula, that's two times four is eight, eight plus the original 21, that patient's gonna be breathing in 29% oxygen versus the rest of us are at 21% oxygen. Things like a BVM or non breather can get the patient up to about 90 or even 100% of what they're breathing in is oxygen. Obviously, if we put them on a mechanical ventilator, we can, of course, get them anywhere from zero to 100. You do need to know the flow rates for each of these devices. A nasal cannula flow rate is going to be one to six liters per minute, and it cannot be more than six. A non breather is going to be 10 to 15, and it cannot be less than 10 and a BVM is gonna be 10, 15, and you could even go higher than that. Now we do know that a patient who gets oxygen, that all of us breathe oxygen, and that when we give patients oxygen, it's a relatively benign intervention. It's hard to screw it up. However, we can give a patient too much oxygen. Hyperoxia is where we give a patient too much oxygen to the extent that it causes harmful effects. O2, all of you are familiar, is oxygen. O2, it's two oxygen molecules. If we give a patient too much oxygen, those two molecules break off into O and O. And those oxide molecules can cause damage in our blood vessels and in our body. That's called oxygen toxicity, and we don't want that to happen. Another ad potential adverse effect of administering oxygen to a patient is hypoxic dry. I'm going to talk about that really quick, but this is really going to be more in your other courses that are going, going, uh, going on in your nursing or nurse practitioner school. So let's talk real quick about hypoxic drive. All healthy patients that don't have COPD or a few specific diseases, their drive to breathe, the body telling them, hey, take a breath, is based on a buildup of carbon dioxide in their body. When the carbon dioxide, the CO2 level gets high, the body says to breathe to get rid of that CO2. Some patients, and most commonly we're talking about COPD patients, they have such a high level of CO2, the body never gets rid of enough of it to have a perfect normal level. So instead of constantly breathing all the time, the body switches, and now instead of waiting till your CO2 is too high that you need to breathe it off, it waits till your oxygen is too low that you need to breathe it in. At the end of the day, it has the same net result. The patient's breathing, whether it's because when their CO2 is high or their oxygen is low, both of them stimulate the patient to breathe. The difference becomes if I give you oxygen. If I give a patient oxygen who has switched over to what's called hypoxic drive, 
now this patient is only breathing when their oxygen level gets too low. If I give you a really good oxygen level, then you may actually stop breathing for a while because your oxygen level is really good. But now that CO2 is just going to go way up because you're not getting rid of that because you don't have that drive anymore to breathe to get rid of CO2. Again, this is just touching the surface of what this is. But since this is the adverse effect of a pharmaceutical agent, it is fair game in any pharmacology course or on the NCLEX to make sure you understand that. Finally, the last point about oxygen is that we do not give this to patients that have a good oxygen level, 95% greater, depending on the book you look at, 94% or greater. We don't give patients oxygen if they don't need it. We used to, back in the day, everyone who's having a heart attack gets oxygen. Everyone who's having whatever gets oxygen. We don't do that anymore. Now we give it based on the patients that need it. So let's talk about our first pulmonary disease. And most of what we're gonna talk about today is asthma. And most of COPD relates back to asthma as well. So let's do a quick patho. There are three problems that a patient that has asthma is experiencing. Now when we talk about asthma, we talk about an acute exacerbation of their asthma. The first is bronchoconstriction. The lumen of the airway that is this big, that's meant to pull in air, now gets smaller. Bronchoconstriction, it constricts, it gets smaller. The second problem is inflammation. Again, the lumen of the airway, it already got smaller, but now the walls of the airway got inflamed, they got swollen. So now the walls got thicker, so that makes the inside even smaller. And now that the inside got even smaller, again, it's getting more difficult to move air in and out. And the third problem is not only did we constrict, not only did we become inflamed, which made it even smaller, but also we have excessive secretions that are taking up more of that space in that lumen, and now that's the third problem. So bronchoconstriction, bronchoinflammation, and excessive secretions. Those are the three problems that a patient with asthma has. And as we go through a whole bunch of about a dozen different drugs and drug classes to treat this condition, we're going to keep relating it back to which of these three problems that specific medication is meant to address. When we talk about treating asthma and also COPD, we're going to break it down into two groups. There's the acute exacerbation and there's chronic long-term management. Acute exacerbation is what I'm going to give when a patient's having trouble breathing because of their asthma or COPD right now. And then there's what I'm going to give a patient to prevent them on a daily basis from having an exacerbation of their asthma or COPD. I do have the list here broken down between emergency treatment and long-term management. I'll let you go through that. We're going to jump right into the medications. So the first thing we're going to talk about are beta agonists. And I want to be crystal clear, especially for testing purposes. What is the first universal medication that anyone who's having trouble breathing is getting? Oxygen is going to be the answer, unless it specifically states that they have a normal pulse ox level. Next, if a patient is having an acute asthma exacerbation, in addition to oxygen, what would be the universally accepted first line drug? That answer is for sure going to be albuterol. Albuterol fits in the drug class of beta agonist. If you've already watched our lecture on adrenergic medications, you know that a beta agonist is promoting bronchodilation. So we said that one of the problems in asthma is bronchoconstriction. This is going to dilate it back open again. The mechanism of action we just covered. So what do we use it for? Again, asthma and COPD. There are a few key adverse effects that I definitely expect you to get tested on. And those are tachycardia, palpitations, and then two electrolyte imbalances, a low potassium and a high sugar. Specifically, I want to point out one thing. When a patient receives continuous albuterol treatments, if someone's having a severe asthma attack and we're giving them one albuterol treatment after another, after another, their heart rate's going to go up and up and up. And that can be pretty scary for a nurse when they see a patient's heart rate go 120, 140, 160. However, keep in mind, the body can tolerate a heart rate of 160. It cannot tolerate a pulse ox of 60. So we need to make sure that we are managing our patient appropriately, which means that if they can't breathe, fix that. Don't worry about the high heart rate right now. You can document it. You can let the provider know, but we're not going to stop the treatment based on a high heart rate because we know the patient can tolerate that in the short term. One thing about albuterol and several other medications we're going to talk about, this is strictly PRN. We never tell them take it every morning and night or twice a day, whatever. It's going to be take it as needed. Okay, It's going to be one to two puffs as much as you need it. Um, generally, there's going to be more specific guidelines up to two every four hours or whatever it is that that specific prescription states. However, an albuterol inhaler is PRN meant to help a patient when they're having a acute asthma exacerbation. Let's point out the one exception to that. 
there's something called exercise-induced asthma. When a patient has exercise-induced asthma, in that case, we tell the patient, take the medication 30 minutes before exercise so that you do not develop that exercise-induced asthma. That's the only one that I know of where we tell a patient to take albuterol when they're not actually having any symptoms. As a nurse, you need to advocate for your patient to make sure they have enough inhalers to cover both them in terms of how long they're gonna be needing it for and wherever they are. So they need one for their backpack, one for their house, one for their work. You need to make sure that they have uh, the right amount of inhalers, advocate for them to the provider to make sure to prescribe enough. And finally, you absolutely must educate your patient on how to use an inhaler, how to use a spacer, when to inhale, when to exhale, that is all part of fundamental nursing knowledge. If you're not familiar with that, there's YouTube videos to brush up on. If you're still in school, there's a skills lab, but this is definitely essential knowledge on how to use an inhaler that you need to know both for your examinations and for the NCLEX as well. Next, let's talk about a similar drug class, which is gonna be a long acting beta agonist. So albuterol we said is a SABA, a short acting beta agonist. Now we have a LABA, a long acting beta agonist. Both of these do the exact same thing, except one kicks in in minutes, actually even seconds. The other one takes in much longer days to get its full effect. So this one is strictly used for the long-term management of asthma COPD. It is not used for acute situations. The drug we're talking about here is salmeterol. Uh, this does have a black box warning that it is not to be used by itself to help a patient that has long-term asthma, and we're going to talk more about that when we get to the second half of the asthma drugs when we talk about long-term management, because now we're focused more on the chronic, on the acute management. So one more time, we have the SABA, the albuterol, which is a short-acting beta agonist. That's for an acute asthma exacerbation. We have a LABA, a long-acting beta agonist. That is for chronic long-term management. These are not interchangeable. The next drug class we're going to talk about are anticholinergic medications. The drug we have over here is ipratropium, and we're going to have one other that I'm going to talk about in just a second. This medication works as an anticholinergic. If you previously watched our cholinergic pharmacology lecture, we got pretty good into the pathophysiology. Let's do a quick refresher. Anticholinergic means anti-parasympathetic. Anti-parasympathetic, another way to say that would be pro-sympathetic. Pro-sympathetic would be pro-fight or flight. You probably remember in fight or flight, we get bronchodilation. So this drug helps with bronchodilation. Also, anticholinergics dry things up, dry mouth, dry eyes, urinary retention, they dry things up. So another problem we said in asthma, bronchoconstriction, inflammation, and secretions. This helps with two of them. This helps with the bronchoconstriction, like we said, it activates sympathetic, plus it helps with reducing the secretion. So it helps with two out of the three problems that we have in asthma. I want to go back to one point. Oxygen, we said, is universal. Anyone who's having trouble breathing, unless their pulse ox is good, they're getting oxygen. Albuterol, everyone who's having an asthma exacerbation, needs intervention, is going to be getting albuterol. From that point forward, after we hit albuterol, some of this stuff is just going to depend on what's going on with the patient. But this is another option that we have, ipratropium. So ipratropium is another quick-acting drug. The drug class is anticholinergic. It causes bronchodilation and a reduction in secretions. It's not first line because albuterol is first line, but it is another option. And we do sometimes, very often, in fact, give it with albuterol. That's actually called a duoneb, where we give a patient albuterol and ipratropium together. Now, there is another drug in this class called teotropium. Teotropium sounds very similar because they are the same drug class. This is a long-acting anticholinergic. So again, just like we had with the beta agonist, we had the short-acting SABA, the long-acting LABA. Now we have the short-acting ipratropium, the long-acting teotropium. Again, not interchangeable. One is for acute, one is for chronic. Teotropium is also referred to as a LAMA, a long-acting muscarinic antagonist or muscarinic blocker. If you remember from A and P, uh, cholinergic receptors, there's two of them. There's muscarinic and nicotinic. This is another way of saying a long-acting anticholinergic, but a term for it is a LAMA. Next drug class we have, again, this is not a first-line agent, but this is systemic glucocorticoids. And we actually discussed corticosteroids in the endocrine lecture, which is still coming up a little bit further down in this playlist. However, we're going to talk about it briefly over here. 
We have a few different drugs that we can use for this, prednisone, dexamethasone, methylprednisolone, and so on. And how does this one work? This one works by suppressing inflammation and it also causes a reduction in secretions. So remember we said asthma has three problems, constriction, inflammation, secretions. This also addresses two of them. It addresses the inflammation and it addresses the secretion. This medication has a lot of side effects. When we give a patient systemic steroids, whether it's oral, whether it's IV or IM, we have a lot of adverse effects. So we're gonna cover all of that in the endocrine lecture. However, this medication does work extremely well. So we do still use it when it is needed, but it is not our go-to medication. Another thing to point out, if the patient gets, let's say put on five-day course or seven-day course of steroids, they always will need to slowly come off of their dose of steroids, never just 40 milligrams, 40 milligrams, 40 milligrams, and done. That's never gonna happen. We have to slowly come off of steroids. And we're gonna talk more about that when we cover steroids in the endocrine section. We do have a number of adverse effects related to steroids. Some examples of that are that it causes immunosuppression, so increased risk of infection. It causes uh, uh, decreased bone mass, so increased risk of like osteoporosis or bone fractures. It causes hyperglycemia and hypertension. All of those we're going to discuss more later on, but real quick, just so you know, those four things are all fair game for a test of what's an adverse effect related to steroids. The four big ones, hypertension, hyperglycemia, immunosuppression, and uh, decreased uh, bone mass. Just like with all the others, we have the systemic steroids that we give right now for acute asthma, but then we also have inhaled corticosteroids or ICS that we use for um, long-term chronic management of asthma. The drugs in this class would be like fluticasone or budesonide. These are given via the inhaled route. And these medications are our first line drug for anyone that has chronic long-term asthma to manage their symptoms. So let's be clear one more time. We had SABA and LABA, acute and long-term. We had ibuprofen and teotropium, acute and long-term. And same thing here, we have systemic steroids and inhaled steroids. The systemic steroids are gonna be our for acute and the inhaled steroids are gonna be for our long-term management. Keep in mind 100%, long-term management, the ICS, we do not use that for an acute asthma attack. We do not use that for an acute asthma attack, okay? It takes several weeks till it kicks in, so we don't use it for that. Also notice that everything we covered so far with the exception of the systemic steroids are given via the inhaled route, the SABA, the LABA, the anticholinergic, and now this, the inhaled corticosteroids, all of that is given via the inhaled route. The only exception so far that we had are the systemic glucocorticoids. Those are given PO or IVIM. Um, we also want to teach a patient who is taking an inhaled corticosteroid, the ICS, that they should rinse their mouth out after using their inhaler, and that is to prevent the rush. And that was definitely something that I would expect to see on a test, especially in nursing school related to pulmonology medications, of what would be um, a necessary education point to prevent rush or what would be an adverse effect of taking um, an ICS. The last drug that we have for the acute asthma exacerbations is magnesium. This is always given as an IV infusion when it's used for this. And this is, its use is very uneven across the country. The guidelines now do have this included as an off-label use for acute asthma exacerbation. We give them an IV infusion of magnesium. How does that help? Well, magnesium is a smooth muscle relaxant. By relaxing these muscles, we can actually cause bronchodilation. However, if we relax them too much, then the muscles stop moving and the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles stop moving, we stop breathing. So we need to balance that out. What I mean by that is we need a monitor to make sure we're not giving the patient too much magnesium. That would be specifically assessing for their deep tendon reflexes continuously or every 15 or 30 minutes, as well as their respirations. Here's a good point to note. Don't just look at the number on the monitor for their respirations because they could also be starting to have shallow respirations and the number on the monitor is not gonna pick that up because their rate is still 16. When you're watching a patient for respiratory depression, especially in a case like this, magnesium, you definitely need to watch that to make sure that their respiratory effort at depth is not decreasing in addition to their respiratory rate. So that brings us to the end of the 
acute medications, and we threw in a few of the chronic ones there because we spoke about the LABA, we spoke about the LABA, and we spoke about systemic steroids. But now let's go on and talk about the rest of the medications that we have for the treatment of chronic long-term management of COPD, the ones that we haven't covered yet. But real quick, while you're here still watching and hopefully enjoying this lecture, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button. All of the content that's offered on this channel is a free resource for nursing, for nurses students, for nurse practitioner students. This channel is just supported by you subscribing, so please go ahead and do that. The next uh, our drug we're gonna talk about is the first one in terms of alternative drugs. And these are not in any particular order, but these are all alternative, meaning they're not first line because the first line for chronic long-term management of asthma is gonna be the ICS, the inhaled corticosteroids. So the first one we're gonna look at are the methyl xanthines, and the drug over here is theophylline. Theophylline works by relaxing the smooth muscles of the bronchi, causing bronchodilation. So again, everything has to relate back to either addressing the bronchoconstriction, the inflammation, or the secretion. This one works on the bronchoconstriction, it dilates. This is one of the alternative options that we have, and this one is actually an oral medication as opposed to everything previously other than the systemic steroids. Everything previously was a inhaled medication. Um, this medication is known to have a narrow therapeutic index, so we have to carefully monitor to make sure the patient doesn't become toxic. The adverse effects of this medication are actually all the same adverse effects that we have related to caffeine. Why? Because this medication is structurally similar to caffeine. In fact, you need to educate your patient not to take caffeine while they're on this medication because they would have a very increased effect. So what are the adverse effects? Insomnia, headache, palpitations, tachycardia, and again, get ready for any possible test questions on what that would entail. For example, which of the following, a patient on which of the following medications would be recommended to take a Tylenol if they develop a headache? Well, this would be it because this is known to cause a headache related to a side effect of the medication. Next, the drug class that we're gonna to go to is the LTRA or leukotriene receptor antagonist. The drug over here is Montelukast, and you may be familiar with this because it not only is used for asthma, it's also used for allergies. So a lot of patients, not a lot, but some patients are on this for their allergies. This works against inflammation, which is why it works for allergies. It's not a bronchoconstriction medication, it works for uh, inflammation. However, this does have a black box warning that it can cause neuropsych events such as depression and suicide. The big thing to note here for test taking purposes related to that black box warning is this wouldn't be an ideal agent for someone who already has a mental health history such as schizophrenia, depression, et cetera. And this one is also an oral medication. The next medication we have are the mast cell stabilizers, and that is going to be chromalin. This one also is an inflammation reducer, so it reduces the inflammation in our patient that has asthma. Again, this is another alternative option if ICS is not enough or is not working. The big downside to this is that it's dosed four times a day. If you remember from our very first lecture of pharmacology, we said that the more times per day a patient has to take their medication, the worse their compliance is going to be. Four times a day is quite a bit. Next, we have monoclonal antibodies. The drug over here is omalizumab or Zoliar. And this one is unique because it works for trigger-related asthma. And we're not gonna get too much into that because it can get really complicated, but this is another alternative agent for someone who has trigger-related asthma. This does have a black box warning, as do most monoclonal antibodies, that it can cause anaphylaxis. Um, and finally, I wanna point out a few combination drugs that we have such as ICS and uh, with a LABA together. Advir, Rio, Elipta, and Simbacor are all really common combination drugs. I wouldn't expect you to have to know brand names, certainly not on the NPLEX, they don't cover that, but you could be expected to know what would be a common medication that a patient could be on that has moderate to severe asthma. Something like budesonide formuterol would definitely be a common answer because Simbacor is used by many, many people um, to control their long-term asthma uh, medications. Finally, when you are treating a patient with asthma, no matter what medication they're on, whether it's chromaline, whether it's ICS, whether it's LABA, whatever, they still need that rescue inhaler. Don't ever forget that rescue inhaler is still there for rescue needs for whenever their asthma gets really bad. Uh, them being on a long-term agent does not negate the need for that. Next, we have this chart. And this chart, this is not mine, this is printed by, uh, I believe it was the National Health Institute. Um, and this was written 
to give us a stepwise approach to managing a patient that has severe asthma. So step one is cut off on this screen, but step one is your SABA PRN. Give you an inhaler, use it as needed, and you're good. Step two and so on becomes uh, kicks in when a patient's needing their inhaler too often. So if a patient's needing their inhaler once a week, great, go for it, you're all set. But now a patient comes into the office and say, I need my inhaler two or three times a day. That's a bit excessive. We don't want that. We'd rather get you on a long-term medication to prevent you from needing it that much. So where do we start? Step two, we start with a low-dose ICS. Patient comes back and says, that's still not enough. Well, then we move up to a medium-dose ICS. Step four, that's still not enough. We give them a medium-dose ICS, and we add on something else, just like these combination drugs that you see in front of you, Advir, Elliptad, so on. We add on a LABA or a LAMA to their ICS. And then moving on, if that's still not enough, we bump up the dose of their ICS and their um, other medication even higher. Finally, step six, if we made it all the way here, we just cannot control their asthma. This is where we can actually go to systemic corticosteroids because we have no other choice left. If you're at the, we basically cover this entire chart during a lecture. If you're going for a nurse practitioner, you're definitely gonna have to know this chart. Now for the last little bit that we have in this lecture, let's go ahead and let's cover other medications related to pulmonology. And over here, we're talking specifically about upper respiratory issues, such as rhinitis, which is sneezing, things such as um, uh, cough and things like that. So the two disease processes, not really disease processes, but the two pathophysiologies we're going to talk about here, the first one is allergic reactions, and that's related to histamine release. And the second one, is viruses such as the common cold. So when patients have these, they go generally to their over-the-counter medications, and that's what we're gonna be talking about now. So the first drug we're gonna talk about is intranasal glucocorticoids or intranasal corticosteroids, generally considered interchangeable. A over-the-counter version of that would be Flonase, and this works as an anti-inflammatory. We already talked uh, earlier that an anti-inflammatory, steroids is the king of anti-inflammatory drugs. So here's just another example of a steroid. What do we use this for? We use it for allergic rhinitis or any pathophysiology that causes rhinitis, such as the common cold. This is considered the most effective over-the-counter treatment for seasonal allergies, just FYI. The next drug class we have are the histamine one receptor antagonists, H1RAs, the general public, and you probably know these as antihistamines. However, we do use the term histamine one receptor antagonist to be more correct because there is a completely different class of drug called histamine II receptor antagonist that we're gonna discuss in GI. Both of these technically are antihistamines. So we do wanna be careful what we're talking about. So in terms of pharmacology, we're gonna say histamine one receptor antagonist. This class of drugs is divided into two subclasses. We have first gen and second gen. The first gen medications are diphenhydramine, doxylamine, and a few others. The second gen you're probably really familiar with, Claritin, Allegra, Zyrtec, and so on. Again, remember you have to know the generic names, loratadine, dexfenidine, cetrazine, and so on. These medications block inflammation related to histamine. Histamine, we know, causes inflammation, and this medication blocks it. What do we use it for? We use these medications for allergies. <clears throat> However, specifically the first generation, diphenhydramine, we also use for insomnia and EPS extrapyramidal symptoms. If you don't know what that is, we covered it in a previous lecture. I believe it was the mental health pharmacology. The adverse effects of these drugs, the second gens really don't have any, certainly not any noteworthy adverse effects, but the first gen do, and that's drowsiness. Obviously, if we're using it for insomnia to make a person sleepy, of course, it's gonna cause a person to become sleepy. Next drug class we have are the nasal decongestions, or depending on what textbook your school or program uses, you may see this referred to as sympathomimetics. So what drugs are we talking about? This would be oxymetazolone, pseudoephedrine, phenylephrine, and so on. The mechanism of action is that it stimulates alpha receptors, which causes vasoconstriction. If you already watched our adrenergic lecture, you know that stimulating alpha-1 causes vasoconstriction. Well, when the nose gets hyperactive, when it has increased blood flow, it can develop these symptoms. And by vasoconstricting, by decreasing the blood flow to the nasal passages, we can resolve nasal congestion. An adverse effect of these medications is restlessness because this is touching on activating the sympathetic nervous system. So it can give you a little bit of that increased um, sense of restlessness. 
Keep in mind, this medication is available both intranasally and it's available orally. The intranasal version is quicker. Again, it's fair game on the test to ask you, when would you expect, when, when would you educate a patient to expect relief from their medication? And you have to be ready to tell them, well, if it's the intranasal version, it's going to be so on. And if it's the oral ver uh, version, it's going to be longer. Finally, this specific drug class uh, stands out among all the other ones over the counter because this specific one can cause rebound nasal congestion. And what that means is you need to educate your patients. They cannot take these drugs for more than three to five days. If they take it for a week or two or three, it's going to become a little bit not addicting, but it's going to become more difficult for them to come off of it because when they do, their symptoms are going to return because their body got used to having this medication on board. Next, we're going to switch gears and talk about coughing. Coughing, the first drug we're going to talk about are antitussis, which means anti-cough. And probably the most used drug for this is dextromethorphan. This decreases the sensitivity of cough receptors. What does that mean? That means it makes it less likely for you to cough. If you have to go this high to get a cough stimulated. So every time I hit this, boom, cough, boom, cough. Versus if I move it all the way up here, now when I only get to here, I don't get that cough response. So it takes more of an effect to get me to cough. That is what it means by decreasing the sensitivity of cough receptors. It reduces the amount that you cough. It doesn't have many adverse effects. Do know that this medication is sometimes abused and know to recognize the symptoms of patients that are trying to get high off of this medication. The next drug class we have are expectorants, such as guafenicin. This medication doesn't make you stop coughing. It helps your coughs become more effective. And by helping your coughs become more effective, you don't need to cough as much. Not much else to say about that drug. It's very common to see this in combination with dextromethorphan. Um, I think most of the major brands, Robitussin, Mucinex, et cetera, do offer a combo of those two medications together because they do work well together. Next for coughing, we have codeine. The drug class for this is opioid, which we've covered in a previous lecture, but this drug works by suppressing the cough. It is a controlled substance and it goes, it is an opioid. So everything that goes along with opioids comes with this. So you get the constipation, you get the hypotension, the CNS depression. It has the black box warning for risk of abuse and dependency, plus a black box warning for respiratory depression. This is a controlled substance. Obviously, this is by prescription only. Everything else that we talked about for cough and cold was all over the counter previously. This medication, since it is a CNS depressant, it cannot be taken with alcohol or any other CNS depressant, such as a Xanax or something like that. Next for cough, we have benzonitate, which is more commonly known as Teslon pearls. This works by anesthetizing or numbing the cough receptors so that they no longer stimulate coughing. This works great on some patients, some other patients, it doesn't work at all. It depends on the patient. This is another prescription option. This doesn't fix any underlying problem. This just relieves the patient who is just coughing nonstop. Next, we have a drug called mucolytics. And the drug over here is acetylcysteine. This one decreases the viscosity of your mucus. I wouldn't expect you really to have to know very much about this. Do know that N-acetylcysteine or NAC is used for acetaminophen overdose. And this medication is also used in other parts of the world for different things. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.